it is very weird that you could share everything with somebody. You break up and then you have to become mortal enemies with them. Yeah. Communication is difficult. We learn our entire lives. It's like working on a muscle and it sucks. You can be happy in a relationship but not be happy all the time. You yeah. can be angry at somebody but still love them and feel super happy with them. You guys were speaking your own languages as opposed to speaking each other's languages. It's very astute, Mari. Damn, we're getting <laughs> deep in here, you guys. Are you ready? <laughs> oh, I like being able to see it. No, you can't look at yourself, Mari. What? I would just look at myself the whole time. Oh, baby. Hi. Welcome to Smoshcast. This is a very special episode um, because today I am joined by Mari Takahashi, as you ooh, all know, ooh, ooh, ooh. and Pamela Horton, who some of you may know as my ex-girlfriend. That me. <laughs> <laughs> This was spurred on by me thinking it'd be a great idea to have Pam on for uh, our Two Truths and One Lie episode. And then, Pam, uh, you got a text from Mari? Well, I, I told her I told her about the idea of coming on for Two Truths and a Lie, and I was like, I don't want the summary of our relationship to be a joke on the internet. So she was like, well, I think, you know, if you want that, you should talk to him about it. And so I think the podcast would be a good idea. And I was like, that is a good idea. So. negotiate hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw the, the text come in when we were in the pitch meeting. I think I already explained this in, in the last podcast, but uh, we're in the pitch meeting and I, I saw the text come up and I was just like, Oh, no. And everyone was like, what, what? And I was like, uh, Pam thinks it'd be a good idea for uh, her to be on the podcast. And, and everyone was like, yes. <laughs> and I knew I knew that it was also a good idea. It's just, whoo, baby. But here we are. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about communication. Yeah. yeah just talking yeah. about things. We, want, we and, also want to bring to light just how we want to normalize what we went through, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, people need to see how different, you know, re relationships can be, mm -hmm. how different relationships can end, mm -hmm. you know, because we only see on the Internet, you know, the best parts of relationships. Yeah. And then suddenly there's the breakup video. Yeah. And it's like, wait, how did we get from like perfect couple goals to suddenly like people being it's always kind of that thing where it's like. We're still friends, you know, and like, you know, we still still love each other, but we don't. It's like, wait, what? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it's weird because I think, you know, like all of us and I think a lot of people look at like TV and Hollywood movies and grow up with those being like a measurement of what relationships sh should be like. Yeah. But now with online culture, we're able to see so much more. And then the people who are going through those relationships are like, well, how do I navigate this? What yeah. do you make public what do you keep private to yourselves and then when when you do break up like how do you tell an audience that that has followed that journey for so long well and also too you hear comments like when people are like oh you know like uh i think i want to marry him or whatever and they're like you guys have only been together for a year it's like i'm sorry is there some sort of outline i'm supposed to stay within in in like a relationship or yeah. you know like uh, people will talk about their relationship and then receive that level of I don't want to say judgment, but people think they know how relationships are supposed to be. and Nobody does. Nobody does. I mean, we, we have a friend. Her parents were in an arranged marriage, and they're still together. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, it, it, it's different for everybody. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the, best, the best thing to get out there, and I think that, you know, one of my goals with this podcast is just, like, putting out the idea that nothing is black and white. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's all shades of gray. Mm-hmm. Fifty shades. Fifty. I, know, I, was, <laughs> I was like, "Don't say it! Don't say it!" Uh, <laughs> so, do you have anything more to say about that before I before I dive into this this beast? No, uh, I, I think we'll be able to hit a lot of different topics on it today, and I think we're, we'll get a a, a bite sized sort of uh, look into your guys' relationship in this modern world. Okay, I think before we. I mean, we can't even talk about the the sort of breakup without talking about how we got started, I suppose. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And, and, you know, because in, in all those YouTube videos, it's always just about the breakup and 
and you don't get any sort of color to like, you know, what happened, you know, how you even got to that point. Well, I feel also too, a lot of uh, YouTube couples are very upfront with like how we, oh, this is how we met and this is what we do when we get home and this, is you know, they, they line it all up. Yeah. Yeah. So I think. We'll start from the very yeah, beginning. Yeah, start how, from the very beginning. How did you guys meet? Well, uh, I, I guess I guess from the very, very beginning, uh, Pam DM'd Anthony, mm -hmm. uh, wanted to do a collab. And what year was this? This was 2006, 15? Two, oh, I, mean, I was like, 2006 no, six, or 15? No, no, no. 16 or 15. Um, 15? In 2015. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, the, re the only reason I slid into Anthony's DMs and not <laughs> yours is because Anthony had been following me already. Yeah. And, um, you know, at the time I was working at Playboy and Gamer Next Door, and um, we had this show called Mansion Game Night, and we wanted to get people in so that we could collaborate. And immediately we were like, oh, yeah, it'd be great to get Smosh. And... You know, since Anthony followed me, I was like, you know what? Like, let's just let's just, you know, break the ice with, hey, do you want to come to a Playboy party? Which was a thing that a lot of people wanted to do. So it's always a good end. Yeah. So, um, you know, Anthony was like, oh yeah, you know, I think I got something going on that night, and and I didn't hear anything from him. And then um, uh, I think they had a conversation, and then Ian. <laughs> came in and uh, wanted definitely wanted to go to the party. So he started following me and right. then slid into my DMs. Yeah, yeah. So Anthony had mentioned it when we were shooting. And and he's like, yeah, the thing of the Playboy party. I was like, Playboy party? <laughs> and I mean, just just like, it's just one of those bucket list things, you know? Like, just, just to say you did it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, that sounds cool. I want to, sure. And it was at, it was at Comic-Con. And we were already going to Comic Con for like a Assassin's Creed uh, thing, so I was like, "Yeah, why not?" While well, I'm there, go to this party. So, and did uh, you go by yourself? Because we were all there, but I know that we didn't get I to took, go. I took yeah. Ryan, I took Ryan Todd, our director. Mm -hmm. with, I, I felt like you know Ryan had done so much work for us; he deserved a little treat. Um, so I got you know I got a plus one. So I took I took my boy Ryan. Yeah, so I slid into your DMs. I was like, "Hey, I'll go." Mm -hmm. um, so we went there. Um, you were very lovely, and was <laughs> <laughs> you are a very a very lovely person. Uh, the party was terrible. Yeah, it I, really was. Because normally, because you said normally like Playboy throws like this very like elaborate party. Oh, and this yeah. time they just like they they just rented out a club. It was all douchebags. Uh, yeah, see, I think the the issue that we were running with uh, was the fact that no no sponsors wanted to pay the amount that it cost to throw a Playboy party. So uh, we just did what we did. So I tried to do my very best to make sure that he had a good time. He was cramped in this like small area, and then. I, I pulled uh, my bunny suit power, and I've never done this before. I walked up to VIP, and they were like, you can't come back here. And I was like, they're with me. And then I brought them into VIP, even yeah. though they weren't VIP, because it was like an open space. You could sit down. It was nice. And then he, from that point on, all he had was the ability to talk to me, because I had to you know, make sure I was with him in the VIP section. Otherwise, he would have been kicked out. Yeah. So we, we talked for, for a while. It was very loud. And then uh, and then we left. And then I, uh, I think I threw my number at you uh -huh. in, in the DMs. I was like, hey, these DMs are, are really annoying to talk. So we should just, like, you know, exchange numbers. That's a move. Mm -hmm. Even though DMs are pretty much the same thing as text. It's like, it's so much easier if you just text me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know? So did that. And then... It's like, hey, uh, well, you know, when we're back in LA, like, let's let's hang out or whatever. And then we went on. What I what I outwardly, I didn't think I was I was taking you out on a date, but I think like, in in my deep deep subconscious, it it totally was. <laughs> but I ended up it ended up being the most cliche date ever because we we went to dinner and then we got a drink and then we saw a movie. So it's like the ultimate, like the ultimate, like cliche date. Mm -hmm. But then we finished it off with um, Mario Kart because you were talking up your Mario Kart game, mm -hmm. and um, who won? I won. Ian did. Wow. But uh, but <laughs> rematch needed. But Pam claims that that she was sandbagging. Well, also too, we have a history of evidence where I have sandbagged. Ian. This is true. <laughs> this is true. She. <laughs> She's a sandbagger when it comes to um, uh, pool, billiards, because she she was 
I could tell she was like playing along, like "Oops, ha ha ha," and then like, and then she would just clean up. <laughs> just a ringer. Yeah, um, but I still like to think that that I beat you fair and square in, oh, yeah. in Mario Kart. I'll, I'll give that to you. You have that. That's sure. Worth. Yeah. So you guys meet. Yeah. At what point does that move into um, this is getting serious territory? Did you guys know when well, it was getting serious, and what was that like? I was I was of the mindset that you know like this is a work thing. I you know really want to work together, and he he sort of made it clear um, that it was like Ian and Anthony were never going to be on on Mansion Game Night. But uh, at the same time, I had so many things in my head. So although Ian was like, we should do this, we should date for a good (laughs) amount of time, I was like, I, you know, I'm not ready. I had just gotten out of an emotionally abusive relationship. I was really worried that, you know, the, the reactions and the way that I would treat him were a conditioned response and not really me. So I was very, very upfront with the fact that I was like, I'm not comfortable, you know, like, I, I just not, I'm not ready yet. And he was... Uh, a patient boy. Um, That's one way to say it. Another way to say it is persistent. Yeah, yeah. But understanding, like, and I think, you know, so we, we hung out a few more times. And I think the kind of the point where you were asking, like, when when did we sort of know that it was something more? For for me, it was, you know, when, when you opened up to me about sort of like your whole like crazy history, like, you know, the, you did not have the, the best... Um, environment for a a healthy upbringing i guess i should say <laughs> that's a good way to put it and i knew a lot i knew other people i i sort of dated somebody before before you that went through uh, just way less than that but wore it on their sleeve and and that was their identity of like of like this happened to me and this is who i am because of it mm-hmm. and and you were you were who you are d- in spite of of your sort of environment. And, and that to me was, was the thing that really stood out because it just showed like how strong of a character you had. And for me, that was, that was, that was really cool. Um, Um, well for, for me, I had, uh, you know, usually I set my walls pretty hard and I'm like, I'm not going to do the thing. And also too, I had this like apprehension about dating someone famous, you know, like, uh, uh, I, I don't want to be the girlfriend. I mean, although I loved being the girlfriend, I didn't want to be known as the girlfriend. Like, here's Ian and his girlfriend. Here's, you know, like, I wanted to be, I, I had my own drive. I wanted to be known for more. But at the same time, like, I felt there was something real because um, normally the way that I process things is I deal with something and then I go to what I call my Pam cave. I don't want to be mean to anybody. You know, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings by saying something I don't mean because I'm angry or I'm sad. So I go to my Pam cave, I heal, I get some perspective, and then I come back and I try to be a a healthy adult. And um, uh, Ian was the first person in my entire life that ever made me feel comfortable talking about what it was that bothered me or what, you know, uh, the hard stuff. And he he listened. He gave, you know, um, neutral advice. And it, it really, it really, you know, it, it hooked me. I, I fell. I fell. <laughs> I feel like, um, you know, I mean, obviously, Ian, you're a public figure. You are also a public figure within, like, your industries. And did you guys have a discussion of like what are we gonna make public what are we gonna keep private my initial response was to keep basically everything private because that's how my last relationship was I didn't really post anything Mm -hmm. about our relationship and maybe that's just because like I wasn't I wasn't always like so sure of everything for for Pam and I like one of the first things was well I guess I guess we probably can't collaborate because we didn't that was that was one of your one of your big things, Pam. Was mm-hmm. was I don't want to be seen as this person that's using. Mm-hmm. Like you didn't want to be like a climber. Ever, yeah, yeah, yeah climber. you didn't want to look like a climber. So even in opportunities where I could have or I could have pushed more for it and received it, I didn't because I didn't want people to be like, oh, well, she started dating him and now she's getting stuff. Oh, like typical or whatever. Yeah, and I mean you're super talented in in your space with gaming and everything, so. I, I was pretty confident that, you know, you doing everything on your own, you would eventually reach a place that would be, you know, beyond whatever yeah. I was doing. One of the one of the best things about my relationship with Ian was the fact that 
we've always been very upfront with each other. Like, um, you know, at at the beginning of our relationship, we had already had the religion talk, the 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 baby talk, the like every important talk that couples need to have. We had it at the very beginning, and we also, um, you know, we had this. Uh, this, this, I don't know, like a set of ground rules of, of sorts. Like, you know, at the beginning it was like, uh, don't post any pictures of Ian on my social media, which I was, I totally get, and uh, stuff along those lines. And um, because we, we had per- public personas that we were very, you know, um, particular about how we were perceived. So um, we, we had a great amount of respect for each other and we still have a great amount of respect for each other. And that's something that I look back on and I'm like, that was super grown up. Yeah, because you're adulting. <laughs> and honestly, like some of those, some of those like rules changed or relaxed. Like mm-hmm. you know, it, it came to a point where, because I think at the beginning of the relationship, obviously you don't know where it's going to go. You don't yeah. completely know the person. So, you know, before you, I, I did, I did a, a small about a small amount of man hoeing, like not a lot, <laughs> but like a, a small, small amount. So, <laughs> right of passage. So, so you know, if I was, if I had seen these other sort of like small like dating things not work out, like I wouldn't want to post about it online and then have like everyone know about this person, then everybody yeah. come after this person because our relationship didn't work yeah. out. So at the beginning, I was very guarded, and then you know, as as the months went on, I was like. No, this is like this is a real real thing. Then it was like, okay, I'm gonna make an announcement. Then this is gonna be sort of just a normal thing for people to know about. Mm-hmm. So I had like made that post where I was like, "This is my girlfriend Pam. I love her more than anyone else, mm-hmm. and we're together. And um, if any of y'all have a problem with that, too bad." Um, it's so interesting because you know, without the public personas, you do that within your own friend and family group, where yeah. it's like, like when is it the right time to introduce so and so to the rest of your, you know, people in your life? But having pr- public persona, it's like, okay, I'm doing this with hundreds of people or thousands of people or however large your audience is, mm-hmm. and so it's kind of like you're almost putting on this. Um, uh, like responsibility on everyone else. Hmm. So it's a weird thing to have to navigate these days. But I think you guys did a really a, a good way by communicating in the beginning. Communicating's hard, especially yeah. difficult situations. I, I feel like I'm still working on it after being with the same person for nine years and he still has to pull things out. And he's like, I mm. know you're upset. What are you pissed about? And I'm like, nothing. And then five minutes later, I'm like, okay, it's this. But it's really difficult. How do you set yourself up to have difficult sit- communication with each other? How do you sit each other down? How do you rev yourself up to do it? How do yeah. you guys navigate that? I know you 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 have one side to this, and I think actually, Mar, you and I are probably on very similar pages when it comes to like being open about you know what we're feeling. I guess we both have toxic masculinity, <laughs> you and I. Yeah. So masculine. Yeah, so that was that was always an issue with me. And I'd say that was that was one thing that I never I never quite worked out in our relationship and that was actually one of the big that was one of the big big, you know, I'd say that was the ultimate hitch in our in our relationship. I mean, do you agree? It, it's it's up there. It's it's <laughs> it's up there because it was one of the first um, issues that we had started having because I had gone from like I said being able to talk to somebody about my problems, then when when the issues started arising in our relationship, when I tried to talk to him about them, instead of being open and receptive, he was very closed off and. Uh, just uh, not necessarily unwilling to talk, but just didn't know what to say. And so he always felt put on the spot. And, you know, that led to a little bit of agitation. And I, uh, because of my emotionally abusive relationship, when anger starts rising, I start like minimizing, you know, like I, so that made for a not very good level of communication. And it just built from there because we were never able to truly like, you know, uh, figure out a true way to communicate with each other. 
Yeah, I, I think there's some sort of saying where it's like without communication, two people in a relationship see the relationship completely differently. Mm-hmm. Like you, you're like you're reading two different yeah. books. Ian, was there any point where you felt like you were getting better at communicating, and why did that happen? How did you how did you get there? No. <laughs> That's, I don't that's think an I, honest answer. <laughs> I don't think I did get better. That's where I see my my biggest failing in the relationship was I I didn't get better and I didn't put in the work to to get better. You know, I would I think I would go through I would go through like spurts of of trying. There's peaks and valleys of of my attention to our relationship because I a lot of times I put work first. I would put, you mm. know, smosh first and and you know making sure that everything was was going smoothly over there especially with all the defy so it was there was a lot going on outside of the relationship and i and i lit that effect this the thing between pam and i it's a really easy way to um not deal with things Mm -hmm. and i think you and i are really similar we don't like like confrontation. Mm. And for me personally, the reason why I don't communicate a lot of the times is like I, I get into a, a thing where I'm like, no, I can like I can do it myself. Like I, I'm independent. I can yeah. I can figure it out. And I think that's the reason why it builds up builds up for me um, when from the outside, he knows me so well that he understands that there's something going on, but he still has got to pull it out of yeah. me. And did that, did that come, like did your sort of like closed offness come from your because you were in a long-term relationship before that Mm -hmm. um was it eight years yeah so did that come from that or was it more of just like family like we don't talk about like how we're feeling that kind of stuff i do think i i mean i think it's both right i think all of our experiences add up to like who we are i think as a family we're very japanese we don't talk about things that essentially don't matter for everyone, Mm -hmm. even though they really do. Mm -hmm. Communication is very stunted, um, especially about emotions and things like that. I think with my last relationship, it was, it it got to a place where it needed to end so much earlier, but everything that we talked about was almost a burden. You know, a, a simple conversation turned into days of talking about it, sitting down and like, we gotta talk. And so I, I think that it was – some of it was just, like, being tired from having to have to have these talks. Because your energy level changes when you have to have these talks. And so it's like you have to put a hold on everything, including work and the things that you can run away to, like TV and yeah. entertainment. Distractions. Yeah. And, and, and you just got to put yourself down and hunker down and just do it. Um, but those talks weren't productive. So what's what's the difference between the talks you were having – and, like, the talk that you should have been well, having. I feel like, I mean, I obviously don't know the situation, but I feel like it's, like, actions speak louder than words. Saying you're going to do something without actually opening up your mind and doing the thing, I think that you say, I'm going to try, <laughs> I'm going to try harder, and I'm going to do this, and I want to do this, and then not following through with your word. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes you say, like, I'm going to do blah, blah, blah to make things better because it's it ends the conversation. Mm-hmm. It makes it easier. Yeah. It's, uh, but I think, you know, I, I think it's also seeing what you can and can't do in a relationship and understanding that. And it only comes from experience of being like, you know, I remember in my last relationship, I would cry on the phone as a, a way to communicate that there was something wrong without me saying those things. Hmm. Um, and it was just a reaction and, 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 and it, like, we could go so deep with it, but it goes back to, like, childhood, right? Yeah, like, yeah. how do I get a reaction out of somebody? What do I know in my life? And, you know, sometimes it's yelling at the person. Sometimes it's crying. Sometimes it's, you know, doing something really, like, drastic to hurt them emotionally or physically. So it goes back to, like, what you know as a kid. But um, to answer your question, I think it's asking Having my partner ask the right questions Mm -hmm. is what it came down to for me to be able to communicate better. Yeah. So Pete just knows the right the right angle the right road to go down. Yeah, and that road is um, just asking really hard questions, Mm -hmm. and he doesn't pull any punches when when he knows that we need to talk about things. 
communication is difficult. Yeah. I think I think we it's something that we learn our entire lives. It's like working on a muscle, and it sucks. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I guess I guess with with you and Pete, it's like, well, you know, this is going to be this is going to hurt maybe for a short while, mm-hmm. but the the lasting effects are going to be much better. Yeah, yeah. I that's that's the positive of it. I think a lot of people don't do it because it's like, well, what if this is the catalyst that makes a relationship end? If a relationship was going to end because of a conversation, it shouldn't be happening in the first place. Like just like a conversation where you're establishing who you are, what what you know you need and a lack of willingness to compromise. You know, like if if you approach someone about that and they're just like, Poof, it's like, OK, you know, I did I did my best, you know. Yeah, Absolutely. Were there any um, examples of real successful attempts of communication and also failed attempts that you can think of? In in most cases, I'm a good listener. I'm I I am very open to hearing about the other person, but it's hard for me to do the opposite. It's hard for me to sort of spill my guts. Where does that come from? Do you think? I don't know. It's oh, it's getting real deep. <laughs> I mean, it's it's probably very similar. Um, you know, both of my parents are Japanese. Uh, no. um, I think you know some of it comes from from my upbringing. I don't think we really talked about you know our emotions that much. Um, and then the the long term relationship that I was in, a lot of those conversations could be could become a little off- offensive, and I would have to go on the defense. You know, obviously, I I think she's she's wonderful, and we we're still friends. But um, I think I, I sort of built up this sort of defense mechanism of just like shutting down and being like, okay, I'll just, I'll just ride out this storm. And then, and then tomorrow will be, or, or not even tomorrow, like 30 minutes later, things will be okay. I think for me, you know, I sort of carried those, those scars of my past into this relationship. And I think, you know, what I'm, what I'm finding out now, um, and, you know, even sitting here is it's just kind of like, you know, you can't carry, you know, it's good to carry some things from the relationship, some things that you learn, but you can't carry all the baggage from, from your relationship into the next person, because that person isn't the same exact person as the Mm -hmm. person you're seeing now. What they, well, some people do end up dating the same kind of people, (laughs) but that's, that's a totally different kind of, uh, you know, thing. But it's weird. Like we get triggered, right? Yeah. Like if something is similar to something you've felt beforehand, you're like, okay, I know what to do in this, in this situation. I'm going to armor up. I'm going to, I know what my pitch is. I know what yeah. I'm going to, you know, like. Well, every, I mean, every person, every individual person is a different puzzle piece, you know, like you have to take the time to get to know them. You have to figure out how you guys work together. Um, You have to, you know, have a lot of introspective. And, you know, if you don't enter a relationship with a completely clean slate, it's going to be really hard to establish the connection that you two genuinely have, you know? Takes years to figure that out, too. Uh, You know, it's like... How many relationships have we all been in? And we're like just figuring this out, like and and almost having to have to like stop ourselves, even yeah. though we know it. Our emotions get a hold of well, us so much that it's hard to. I feel like I feel like before before the relationship that I had with Ian, he he mentally broke me down. Like I didn't know who I was. I didn't know because he had conditioned me. He had manipulated me. I mean, emotional abuse in some regards is as uh, the life um, the effects are as long lasting as physical abuse because you the person in your head isn't you and then you have this you know uh existence problem where it's just like i who am i and so i had to be broken down and then take a year and a half to build myself up again to to really be like that's me this these are my feelings and you know being really aware of what i was feeling and what they were feeling and um you know having this awareness but it took me being broken down emotionally to nothing. So, you know, not everybody, ha- like, I don't go into relationships expecting people to have that because I don't want people to have experienced that. But, you know, I can't go into a relationship expecting that people know what they need to do or how they can communicate or, you know, whatever. So 
I, you know, I used, I tried to be patient. I tried to use different ways to communicate with Ian. I tried to, you know, wait until certain times. Like I, I, I knew that, you know, there was a way that we could work this out at just figuring out how. Yeah, it's almost, it's such bullshit that we have to like, like figure out when the right time is and yeah. stuff right. like that, you know, but it's so human too because it's like we want the best conditions to have the talk and all these things. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to switch gears and talk about your health over the past year. It's been a tumultuous year for you, 13 Oof. surgeries. Oof. I mean, I think, I think you know, we, we've, we've all in some ways felt that journey along with you. Um, and I know you're going through some stuff right now as well. Um, I'd like for you to talk about it and then also talk about how that affected your overall relationship. Um, this would be the point where I'd probably cry. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, um, but, oh, God. No, 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 no. <gasps> Makeup. <laughs> we also, like, you know, if if it's more, I mean, we talk about whatever you want to talk about. Well, we don't have to talk about I it mean, if you don't want to. I mean, it's mostly, like, um... <laughs> The last, uh, like, I want to say, like, last six months, I really, like, spent the time feeling the effects of my health and the way it affected my um, my relationship with Ian. What I went through was very hard, and what what a significant other of someone who's going through what I went through is very hard, and it was hard on both of us, and, um, but uh, to... You know, summarize, I had to get that out of the way. Um, To summarize, like, uh, I've always had um, uh, issues with cancer. I was first diagnosed when I was 18. I've been in and out of remission, like, like now at this point, I don't even know, like six times. Um, All uterine cancer or, you know, cervical cancer. And, um, you know, I... uh, um, at the beginning of the relationship, like the g- a good first half of the relationship, nothing really went wrong. Like I was doing okay health wise. I had, like you know, IBS because of a you know like stress and stuff like that. But nothing that was too. I had a few scares, but nothing that was too, you know, um, uh, destructive to me and my emotional state. And then um, I had this like it was the day of the the uh, eclipse, the solar eclipse. And I went, I had a doctor's appointment where I was supposed to go in and, um, you know, uh, a just normal well woman's visit or whatever. And, um, I had been having some issues. And so, you know, we did this, uh, ultrasound and they found like a really large mass on my, on my ovary and like, you know, you know, getting biopsies on ovary masses is really hard. So they try to do as many tests as they can, but I just had this really bad feeling about it from that point on. Like, well, even before I went to the appointment, I was telling Ian in the morning, I was like, something's wrong. Like yeah. I, something's going to happen. And I just, my intuition was telling me like something's wrong with my body. And then I went in for that. And it turns out that that wasn't actually the issue. Um, I had, uh, because of all the issues that I've been having, all the cancer, the family history. And I also have uh, this condition called Lynch syndrome, which is. Um, you didn't find out about Lynch syndrome until. Well, at, the, at that point, I'd actually known, okay. um, but I just didn't know exactly what it meant. Um, yeah. The doctor who had prescri- or prescribed it, um, uh, you know, diagnosed it, you know, I immediately was like, hey, can we consider hysterectomies? Because I- I've been on the no kids mindset for a good portion of my life. And, you know, like, I, I don't think. And then she was like, no. And, you know, like, so. You know, I went to a genetic counselor who was like, you know, your best, the best thing that you can do to guarantee that you don't get cancer is have a hysterectomy. And if you don't want to have kids, you know, like I will, I will support that and help you find a doctor. And he did. And so I had a, at the um, beginning of January, I had a hysterectomy and um, it was prophylactic at the time. And then they did the pathology afterwards and found what I had been fearing, you know, like they, mm-hmm. it, fortunately, it, we had taken it all out and, you know. Uh, so the hysterectomy is what? 
Oh, sorry. A hysterectomy is when they take, um, there's different types of hysterectomies. There's one where they take just the uterus, but no cervix. There's one where they take the uterus and the cervix. There's one where they take, you know, like, the, the, uh, I had what is called a hysterectomy and salpingectomy, where they took my uterus, or a total hysterectomy and salpingectomy, where they took my uterus, my fallopian tubes, and my cervix. And um, because all, all of those parts are, are part of the, the, you know, the uterus. And so that's where my cancer had previously been and where my cancer risk was most uh, because you, you're more likely to get cancer if you've had cancer. And we had a game plan for what we would do if, um, you know, uh, after after the hysterectomy, you know, 10 years later, we'll take out the ovaries to reduce your ovarian risk. Because with Lynch, with, uh, with Lynch syndrome, I have, uh, you know, ovarian risk, uterine risk, um, colon risk, and stomach risk, and neurological oh, risk. Wow, and nice. yeah, yeah, it's like it's 27 different types of cancer I'm at risk for. And um, so we had this game plan, and the game plan was completely shot because, you know, I'll try to do best TLDR I can do for, you know, a year of <laughs> hospital stays and surgeries. Um, so I had a um, the hysterectomy, and then I started having abdominal pain in, like, July, and I thought it was, uh, you know, my appendix. So Ian took me to the hospital, and they told me that I had cancer, and... Um, cause I had a mass on my ovary and so, uh, and that was what they left it at. And then I left, I was in the most pain I've ever been in in my entire life. I've reached my 10. Yeah. Yep. That was not, that was not lovely to witness. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sorry for that. Um, but after, after that whole debacle, like I was misdiagnosed at one hospital, I transferred to another hospital where my doctor was like, you just had a torsed ovary because of a cyst and they didn't notice that. Oh, like she was super mad. So basically but, what that means is her ovary got twisted yeah. and it cut off blood flow. So the, the first hospital really goofed that one up. Yeah. Uh, and because of that, your ovary, one ovary died. Yep, I had a an ovary that died inside of me and was starting to, you know, I I developed a fever and was throwing up because it was, you know, dead inside of me and rotting. And I'm sorry if that's gross, <laughs> but <laughs> you had a zombie ovary. Yeah, I had a zombie ovary. Um, and then from that point on, um, it was it was I didn't trust my stomach. I had abdominal pain that was similar. It always felt like gas. I'd always be like, hey, I'll just wait until it passes, you know? But every time I felt that pain, my ovary would twist. Like my left ovary twisted like, what, six times, five or six times. I had surgeries to repair it. And then eventually in the span of a week, I had the surgery to repair it a, one last time. And then what they did was they put it on the front side of my abdomen, which basically if I banged up against the sharp corner of a table, I would just rupture my ovary, you know, like they, they were trying all they could, but then they were like, okay, you know what? Uh, how do you feel about menopause? Um, so feel? you mentioned for the first six months, your health was fine. It was yeah. probably for the first year. Yeah. First, year and a half. First maybe. year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. First year and a half. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you're, you're committed to this relationship. You're, you, you've been in this relationship for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Things start to happen. How does that how did that make you feel, Ian? Like how does that take a toll on you? Because you're not expecting this. And in in so many ways, when we start a relationship, it's like that is the last thing you think that you're signing up for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the one of the signs for me that I felt like, you know, this this was like a real a real, real relationship where there was real, real feelings was the fact that, you know, Pam told me that she had a she had a risk of cancer and that she had a history of cancer before we even started legitimately dating. Um, so that was sort of my out. That was like that was like here's the door. If if you're not if you're not about this, like you know, Pam was like straight up. She's like you know, you, you might have to live with the fact that I might die at an early age, and and it didn't really bother me. I mean, obviously. The thought of her dying. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> the, the thought of her dying greatly bothered me, but it didn't scare me away. Right, you're um, like I can take this on. Yeah, it didn't. Didn't. Yeah, that didn't. To me, that wasn't a reason to end things. Yeah. Um, and at that time, Pam hadn't told anybody really about about her it was history my... of cancer. You literally told your your past boyfriend, mm -hmm. like whoever you were in a relationship with, 
when you were ha- when you were going through that, but mm-hmm. you didn't tell your parents. Didn't tell my parents. You didn't tell anybody. Nobody on the internet knew. Like a couple friends knew, mm-hmm. and you told me. Mm-hmm. And and that kind of openness, like, really created this sort of connection between us. I feel. Well, and also too, like you were talking about when when I told you about that, and you thought about like there's a chance that this could happen. Um, there's this thing where you try to imagine scenarios like you try to imagine your significant other dying and like the way that it plays out in your head is never how it's going to play out in real life so i feel that although you were like i can i can handle this when it actually started happening there was there there was something to it that was not necessarily missing but it, it just hit you harder than you thought it would because um you know uh, a good portion of the the reason that I, I, you know, ended the relationship is because I couldn't deal with someone not being emotionally supportive for me while I was in the hospital. Like, I mean, I don't want to go into detail because, you know, I still believe that you're a very good person. But, you know, at the time it was just I wasn't as important. And that's what it felt like. Yeah, that was that was a thing. I think the and we can we can either get to that now or we can get to that later but I, I mean the the sort of straw the straw that broke the camel's back was I was set to go um, on a business trip uh, and it was I was only gonna be gone for two three days the night before I left uh, you started feeling abdominal pain and we had been through this before and you know I was always there at the hospital as much as I could be and it was at this point, it kind of, it was almost routine, right? Yeah. And so, so it was like, okay, no problem. Um, I'm going to go on this trip and, you know, whatever will happen will happen. It's probably the same exact thing as it was before. And I'll be right back and I'll be there and I'll be there for you. But you clearly had different needs for, you know, how you see a relationship being and how you see the person being there for you. And I wasn't there for you as much as you needed me to be do in you, those situations. Do you think that um, one of the reasons that you weren't there as much is because it bothered you? Like the pain and the, the suffering like bothered you so much to the point that you couldn't tolerate being – or not tolerate, but it just – you were uncomfortable being around when it was happening because it hurt so much? Or is it like one of those th- – I, I really – I haven't really broken down exactly why – you weren't there, you know, like, what do you, I mean, maybe you don't have something to explain that with, but I just, any insight would. I think, like I said, it it just, it, it became almost like a routine. Like, you know, we had, we had been through it before. Um, It didn't seem like it was anything new. So we kind of knew what the outcome would be if we figured it was another torsion and it was right. (laughs) <laughs> but what ended up happening is that was that was the final that was the final one, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, the, no, there's one more after. Yeah, the, yeah, there's yeah, that's one. That's right. There's one more after. So, yeah, there's another torsion. Um, I was out on my trip, and then and then you know I came back. I had to deal with some stuff at the office, and and you know, it, and Ryan Ryan, who's <laughs> who's our writer, is sitting behind the camera. Uh, was there was there that day. Uh, and he was like, and he's like, you good? Like you, you like Pam's in the hospital. You should probably go, go see her. I was like, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get over there. Like, I just, you know, I need to, I need to finish this and then, and then I'm going to go. And the hospital is like, I mean, it was two miles away from the office. So it sounds like you run to your defense mechanism, which is running to work. Because that that that's the thing that makes sense for you. Mm-hmm. It's almost like your it's like your safe place, and it, it's a way to to run away from things, which I totally get. Mm-hmm. I think it's one of the reasons why my schedule is like packed to the brim because it's like that's how I know that my life is like like good. Like yeah. I, you know, like it, it it gives you some sort of security to know that it's there. Um, and from the outside, that's what it sounds like because yeah. having to have to deal with it is just so difficult. And I think also, like, I, I was just, I'm very much an optimist, and I've always, I was always an optimist in our relationship. Whenever she was, you know, worried about whatever whatever pain you were feeling, Pam, I was always just like, ah, we don't know. We yeah. don't know until the doctors tell us. Yeah. Like, and, you know, you're like, you know, be 
be prepared for for a loss. You know, I could I could get this and I could be gone in a year or six months or, you know, one time you were diagnosed and they said you had a few months to live. Mm -hmm. So you you're not not well. Oh, well, I mean, not, technically at the ER, kind of. But my that the one that kind of it was way before. Yeah, it was relationship. way before our relationship. Uh, so, I mean, your your sort of outlook on everything is very different from mine you've obviously i'd say i was a realist <laughs> for my life <laughs> right, right not everybody's lives once you've had a life of just stuff is what i'm gonna call it mm -hmm. um you you become very aware that the good that you have is sometimes only fleeting and that bad stuff is around the corner so maybe sort of a pessimist but i'm still I'm still a very positive person, you know? It's so interesting because from the outside, I, it, it really is like you guys are like reading two different books because I can totally see it. Like from Pam's perspective, like you've been through all this stuff, you know how hard it can be and you see it from like a realist point of view um, and and so much emotion comes from that and you're like, you just almost want to like... You want it to be like romantic almost, where it's like, this could be the last one, you know, like, mm -hmm. like, I just want to feel all those things. And then I can totally understand your perspective of just like, no, 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 no like, it, maybe it's not that bad. Like, let's keep our head up and uh, keep things positive. But to you, it feels like you're not being validated, where it's like you're going through all this stuff. Sorry, yeah. Pam doesn't feel validated in what she's going through when Ian is being the best person he knows he could be uh, by just being optimistic. And it's like, it's interesting because we grow up with the saying like, treat others the way you want to be treated. But I think as we grow older, we have to really understand that you have to treat the other person how they want to be treated. And it's like, you, you guys were speaking your own languages as opposed to speaking each other's languages. That's very astute, Mari. Damn, we're getting <laughs> deep in here, you guys. Are you ready? <laughs> That's really good. Yeah, validation is important, I think, as human beings go. And and I can't point to an exact thing that has happened in, in my relationship, but, like, I, I know that feeling of being like, no, this is what I'm going through. What you're saying is too positive for me right now. It's like, get on my level at the moment. And I, I think that, you know, for you, you, you were just doing the best you can for what you know. Right. And that's difficult to be like, well, okay, now I got to learn another language. What's the language that you're you're dealing with over here? So, I mean, I think that's I think that's probably you know, my, yeah, that that totally falls in line with what I think was sort of my my biggest failing, was I I can never I can never get on the same level, and I can never, I don't know, I can never just, I never had that sort of push, to change because you know because the way that the way that i was in my sort of like mental state worked for mm -hmm. me so i never i never felt like i was personally struggling you know mentally um pam would always suggest like you know we should you maybe do therapy like you know she's she, you suggested couples therapy mm-hmm no, well, you suggested therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a firm believer in the fact that if you've never done therapy fo before, do not do couples ther therapy with your significant other. I mean, you, obviously, people can make their own decisions, but I've only heard bad stories. And also, too, if, if like, for instance, if Ian and I had gone to couples therapy and I'm the one primarily having the, the emotional, like, pain um, then it would feel like we need to analyze, you know, why that's happening and what Ian's doing. And then it would turn into like a, you know, a, uh, you know, and I didn't want it to feel like Ian was being attacked by two people, one of which he doesn't even know. <laughs> so, um, you know, I wanted him to kind of figure out his own like understanding of how to communicate and what he needs so that he could tell me that because, you know, like it, it was it, it was really hard to to communicate with each other because I'm upfront and understanding and trying to like do my best to uh, put myself in his shoes. But, you know, Ian's Ian's, um, you know, like he, he was like, I'm fine. You know, that we're good. I'm fine. You know, like and, you know, I uh, I. I understand for the most part why that why that happened. I mean, he said that, you know, work work was 
really important. And so when when our relationship was in jeopardy, it wasn't as much of a motivator, you know, like I wasn't as up there as some other things, you know. So I, um, you know, I, I think that we just never learned how to communicate with each other because of that. Yeah, I think that's probably where I'm the biggest hypocrite is in the fact that I'm a huge advocate for therapy. And I'm and I and I tell people I'm like, hey, man, like everyone should do it. Like, there's no harm. You don't have to be like, you know, you don't have to be like suicidal or think you have a problem to go to therapy. And yet I have never personally made a concerted effort to seek therapy. I keep saying I'm going to. I keep making excuses. Mm -hmm. Do you know why you haven't gone? Like, is it's it, it's, not on the front of my mind. Well, okay. I don't know. <laughs> it's interesting. And, and Pam and Pam like tried. And obviously, you can't you can't force someone else to go to therapy. They For have sure. they have to want it. And and I'm like, man, like, what kind of like crazy cataclysmic kind of like event is going to have to happen to make me seek it out and maybe it's this podcast well, maybe <laughs> but we'll see we'll, well see and and it's not just like with therapy it wasn't like he would make excuses or put it off like ian if it wasn't work or if it wasn't home you know he didn't go to the dentist for a while until i helped go him to uh, make him go to the dentist he didn't go to the doctor for a while he didn't go see a dermatologist until yeah my, you know my, my freaking skin on my hands are falling off are you not going to the dermatologist i gotta go again oh my god i mean it's a little better but you know it's <laughs> it's coming back well, I got like, so it's like it's like eczema oh, or something god. who knows um so that's kind of like that's just how ian's always operated so therapy is just another leg of that so you you're know? saying we just need talk space to sponsor this pod. Wow. <laughs> Ooh, I don't know about, is it talk space or better help that got all better the help? Better help. Yeah. 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 <laughs> talk space. Hit us up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, and maybe, maybe you just need to dig deeper as to why you don't want to go. And maybe it's as simple as you just don't want it. Cause it's not, you know, affecting your every single day life. Or maybe it's something deeper and there's something, you know, like there's you don't want to get into what's in there or, you know, you just don't want to deal with having to have to dig deep into weird things because your day to day life is fine. You know, like you're you like your day to day life, you exist and you're fine. Like it, it doesn't bother you. So maybe that's why you don't want to go. Um, He's a bachelor in a boyfriend's body. It's <laughs> it's. <laughs> It's, it's that, an interesting yeah, topic. It's that kind of thing where it's just like it doesn't like things are like on the outside, everything's going fine. So mm -hmm. it, it's like I don't have this sort of like driver where something's like eating away at me that I need to like do it now. I think it's that kind of thing where like I don't really do things until – it's like an absolute imperative. Until your skin's falling off. Yeah, exactly. Until you can see the bones on my fingers. <laughs> Which we can. It's gross. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> I'm glad we're talking about this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we need to talk about your hands. They're skeletons. Oh, no. Well, yeah. and I also, too, like, I, you know, I, I didn't want this to seem like, you know, like, you know, stuff was going wrong with Ian and like it, it's all on Ian, which was at times the mindset that I had. But I also I know um, that that a good portion of our relationship was weighed down by, um, you know, although uh, he said that, you know, like my past didn't really affect me as much. And I, I was the person I am in spite of it. But when when behind closed doors with the person that uh you know is an extension of me which is how i see relationships like that's when you know like i i am me you know you get to see every aspect of me and so he got to see the part of me that is crazy stressed about my family and and my family is you know like a good source of the drama that that has taken over a lot of my life and that that was a lot and I knew it was uh, at times very strenuous for for him. I mean, like I go, I've gone through what I've gone through my entire life, and that's kind of like my my reality. But to to throw it at him, like that was, you know, at sometimes I feel like um, I was unloading my baggage on him too much. Like it, I know that it was, um, you know, a, a sore spot 
for you. Um, and I didn't want it to seem like, you know, oh, it's it's all like there's a good portion of it that was me. Like I I I'm an emotional like. I'm an emotionally driven person. Like I, you know, uh, I want to, you know, have everybody feel good. And I want everybody to be happy and I want to like be positive, but I, you know, I still have those tough conversations and when the tough conversations need to happen, they happen. And unfortunately, sometimes I would think tough conversations needed to happen in regards to my family and how it affected me. Uh, but they didn't really need to happen, you know, like, but at the same time, although I know that um, my relationship with my uh, my mom was was one of the like the the needles that was poking, um, but Ian was one of the ones. Actually, he was the one that one helped me talk about. Um, like he helped me realize that talking about cancer, my cancer helps people. And then two, he made me realize that I don't have to deal with my mom. <laughs> you know, like he he um, and maybe it was just like stop talking about it. But at the no, same time, <laughs> it was it was physically affecting you like yeah your your relationship with with your family was physically affecting you and mentally yeah and obviously seeing you seeing you hurt like that was was not good and i was like there has to be a better way yeah so there there was a while when when you know you didn't talk to your family and and you know, you're you're back to talking with them and, and yeah, things things sp- very yeah. very sporadically. And obviously, we can cut whatever <laughs> this no, no, out no. that you want. But no, 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 this it, is all fine. But you know, I said, well, if this is affecting you so much and it's negative, and it, just don't don't talk to them. Like, yeah. and obviously that that hurts. And I think that people should always talk to their parents. But if if it's not coming from a place of love, yeah. And it's only hurting you, mm-hmm. then you just need to stop. Yeah, and and you got better. Yeah, like, I did. I got really good. I was I was super they, healthy for yeah, a while. She stressed you out so much that I you was were having literally physical. Sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a hard. It's a it's a very hard conversation to have about divorcing people in your life, and sometimes you have to. Tim Ferriss has a really good chapter in <laughs> Four Hour Work Week. <laughs> But yeah, like the people closest to you, you rely on those people and you it's almost like you you, you feel like they have a responsibility to be your rock, mm-hmm. especially your family. Yep. And it's a hard truth to figure out in, in your adult life that your family, your parents are still just kids. Yeah. Who had kids. Yep. Mm-hmm. And maybe they haven't worked out their stuff yet. Maybe you know, they'll never go to therapy. Maybe they'll never, you know, figure out the small things that bother them. Um but it's it's a hard truth, and you know we all go about it differently. Mm-hmm. But it's important to to figure it out for yourself. Yeah. And in in regards to you know your cancer and and you not telling anyone, you know, for me I felt that it would be healthy for you to talk about it, and also your story was so incredible for me that I felt like people needed to hear about it. I felt like it would help a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I feel like it has. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh and that's why, you know, I've always like loved talking to you about things because you you have such a different but neutral perspective. You you always have an idea that for the most part helps everybody involved or or, you know, I've always felt really comfortable talking to you about things. So when you were like, you know what, I think you should consider this and I was just like yeah, you're right. Like I've been so closed off to it because I've been set in my own ways that I haven't opened my mind to to, you know, something like that because, you know, a part of me was like, I just feel like I'm, you know, being that victimized person where I'm like, I had a hard life, you know, like I don't want to be that person and in the way that I've chosen to do it with, you know, Ian supporting me the entire way was very helpful to people. And that's something that I've always appreciated. I remember your videos, um, you know, you you came out with it and you, you, you know, encouraged people to check themselves out and make sure you go to the doctor. And, you know, if you feel anything, go. And there were so many comments of like, thank you, Pam. I think I'm going to go to my doctor or thank you, Pam. I went to my doctor and, uh, you know, this is this has been preventative for something bigger. So. Yeah, I think that's something really great that you encouraged. Yeah. But I also, I mean, I also understood why you didn't want to do it. You didn't want to be have that be your identity, the mm-hmm. girl, the girl with cancer. Yeah. Cuz you wanted to be 
you wanted to be known and appreciated for your talents, not for this sort of burden. Yeah. So I totally understood that, but I'm glad that you chose to, you know, be open about it. Me too. I think like the biggest takeaway for me, like just as also, you know, in the conversation, but as, as a listener is that nothing is black and white. And I think one of us said that at the very beginning, mm -hmm. it's just like you, you, you guys see photos, videos, whatever of relationships, but you don't see the you know, the, the nights where you're having incredible conversations. You're not seeing the nights where there's tears and misunderstandings and, you know, the days in the hospital and mm -hmm. the days that you're not in the hospital. And it's like you don't see all of it. And I think it's important to remember for all of us seeing relationships happen online that it's just a needle size. It's a pinhole size uh, display of what the whole thing is. Yeah. So... Don't get so caught up in what you see in other people, I guess. Yeah. You know, experience things for yourself and know that it's not it's not perfect. Yeah. Yeah. That's what relationships are. It's kind of like those girls that uh, go to weddings and like, how come we're not married? And it's like, that's not where we're at, you know? <laughs> um, you know, like there's, there's the acclimation to, or I mean the inclination to uh, compare your relationship like, oh, well, so-and-so does this and so-and-so does this and this is what they, they go to these parties and they do this and it's just like, yeah, but... They're not in this relationship. So yeah. Yeah. it's the you have to be able to analyze the way that you work with somebody. And also a big part of that is recognizing red flags, like recognizing signs that you shouldn't proceed. You shouldn't let them do that. Like uh, balance, like the there's no balance of, you know, back because sometimes sometimes, Mara, you might have a really bad day. And, you know, maybe Pete had a bad day, too. But. In his head, he was like, it's not as bad. I'm going to put that away, and I'm going to take care of you. Like, sometimes the the balance is is a little wonky, but there's always it's it's still balance, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it comes back over. And it comes from experience, though, mm -hmm. and so many mistakes. Yeah. you got to make so many mistakes. And then once those, you know, the good still outweighs all of those mistakes, that's when you're like, that's, that's when you keep proceeding, yep. right? But it's when the negatives outweigh the positives that you're like, throw in that towel yeah yeah um i wanted to touch on something oh i wanted to ask you know I, I feel like like you mentioned we've kind of thrown out the rule book of like start dating someone get married have children mm -hmm. watch them grow up and then retire and die like that rule book was so set in place for so many decades yeah like until now, mm -hmm. like that rule yeah. book is gone. What is the biggest misconception of relationships that that you guys have kind of like broken the barrier of? Or I think the fact that you guys are friends after a oh, relationship yeah. is still that's a big yeah. one. That's a big one. Like people can't be friends. It has to be this. I think. Yeah, I mean, to me, thing. to me, I think I said it in the other pod podcast, or maybe I just said it in person. But to me, it, it's it is very weird that you could share everything with somebody you could you know you share the deepest darkest parts of your mind with somebody you share your body with them um you know only if, if you're married though uh, <laughs> no uh, <laughs> but you, you you share everything with this person and then you break up and then you have to become mortal enemies with them yeah. and i and i'm not saying that everybody could be friends with their ex mm -hmm. and I, and that and it's probably unhealthy to think to think that as well like that you know you're going to be friends with your ex, yeah. but you know the way that things ended for us, and the way that things ended with my last long-term relationship, ended on a in a nice way. Mm -hmm. You know there there weren't you know really hurt feelings. Nobody was was screwed over. Yeah, it was just like, hey, is this working out? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there sort of unreconcilable differences? <laughs> Yes. All right. Well, then maybe maybe let's end this. Yeah. Obviously, you know, our relationship didn't end um, that. Um, it wasn't that formal. Oh, I cried a little bit more than that. <laughs> um, I cried like a little bitch. No, I still don't think you did. I, I did. I did the kind of crying where it, your voice gets like. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Well, okay. That was fun. Um, we broke up. We broke up in the hospital. In the hospital, while I was still in the hospital. <laughs> I was just uh, never mind. Um, but, <laughs> but sorry. But I mean, the great, the great. What I really, really appreciated about 
our breakup is, you know, well, you said, let's go on, let's go on a break. And I said, well, I don't believe in breaks. Mm -hmm. So we should probably just end it. And then maybe down the road, maybe mm -hmm. down the road in the future, you know, we'll be walking down the street, run into each other. Hey, you want to give us another go? Yeah. Sure. But for now, let's, let's just end it. If you feel like we need to go on a break, let's just end it. Yeah. And then it wasn't like I just like walked out of the hospital room. We talked for like an hour and a half. Yeah. Felt like a long, long time. I mean, we were talking real fast. <laughs> yeah. You know, you had places to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but <clears throat> I felt like that was, that was so nice to be able to, to like, you know, say like, okay, this is, this is over for now, mm -hmm. but let's talk about it. Yeah. And being able to talk. And then. And then when you went into the hospital the next time, mm -hmm. that's when you had your second ovary removed. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of, you know, all the lady bits. Yeah. Um, and then I visited you in the hospital a few times. Yeah. Um, stayed. I think I stayed the night with you one night. Yeah. Um, and that gave us an opportunity to like really sort More of talk. like yeah. break down like what you know, what the relationship was. Like. Well, we had also made it past the, uh, like, the emotionally traumatic, like, <laughs> oh, God, it's happening now, and what do I do, and how do I wake up? And we had had some time to, to, time to ourselves, and um, uh, so we could really look at the relationship objectively. And I, I don't necessarily think that people who break up should revisit and be like, what did we do wrong? But one of the reasons that I think that Ian and I are able to be such good friends after the breakup is because despite the fact that although we didn't agree on things, we've had a profound amount of respect for each other. We don't necessarily need to agree, but we understand. Like, I don't, I don't know, or I mean, in my head, I I wouldn't operate the same way that Ian would, in, Ian would in some ways, but I understand. I understand him. I understand why he made the decisions, and I respect that. You know, like, I, the, it's the respect that made it so that, you know, like, ultimately, I just, you know, we want each other to be happy. And if it wasn't happening together, we have to, you know— do the the appropriate steps and um we've had respect and uh, understanding of each other the whole way and we can we can cut this part out if if you're not if you're not comfortable with it but <laughs> uh you know then and then you had told me that you were you were with somebody else yeah and it's and it's that kind of thing where like yeah this this hurts me a little bit yeah but if they can if they can give you something that that I wasn't giving and if if they can sort of emotionally fulfill you in a way that that I couldn't then why should I feel hurt you know if 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 you're able to find somebody that that better suits you like yeah it's like sad for me but also like that's that's really selfish of me to be angry about it you know what i mean so well, I mean, the way the way that you worded it, the way that you talked to me about it is just that, you know, like w w a good portion of our lives, like at least, you know, not a good portion, a, a significant portion of our lives was spent in a relationship with each other. You got used to certain things. You had a routine. You know, we we did things together. And now certain things are like, you know, trying to imagine instead of you it being someone else like that's a, that's a real pain like you don't you don't have to like you know uh, make excuse yourself for feeling that i mean it's yeah. it's yeah, you have emotions you have feelings and and you know i've i i've appreciated the fact that you you were very upfront with like hey i in i'm not or not necessarily not okay with the relationship but you're like i you know, I need some time, you know, like, yeah. and I was absolutely. Yeah. I totally understand. I mean, it definitely, like, it definitely felt weird and, yeah. it, and it hurt, but at the same time, I can also rationalize with the fact that like, it's not like you're my property. Yeah. It's like, you're, you're a completely separate human being with your own, you know, needs and wants. And, and, you know, if, if there's somebody else that's, that's better suited, why should I be angry? I think it goes back to this preconceived notion of like what we think relationships are. And, and like, I, I do think that we grew up with this notion that it's like there's one soulmate in the world for you and you'll love one time. And yeah, that's a big old pile of bull. Yeah. It is. You know, I think as humans, we have the capacity to love so much. And yeah. like, and, and I, I think it's, 
at least in my life, I think it's really, really important for me to get it out there that it's okay to continue loving people. Yeah. You know, and it's like it's it's okay to love that that portion of your life, those, you know, two years of your life or eight years of your life or whatever it is, you know, as you move forward into future relationships, it's still okay to have that capacity of love for other yeah, people. Absolutely. Also, if you're young, like you grow up, you become a different person. Yeah. Like it's it's completely rational to say you you started dating somebody when you were 20 mm-hmm. and you're 25 and you've become different people and you're not in love with that person anymore. Yeah. That's fine. That's yeah. understandable. You could be a completely different person and yeah. you don't have to make excuses. Yeah for why you feel differently. Yeah. I, I um, buy into the notion that people have multiple soulmates because the person that I was 10 years ago was completely different. I would probably, we probably would not have even started dating because of the person that I was. And um, I, I believe that the people that I was with and committed to at those times in my life were my soulmate at the time, you know, like I, you know, things got along really well. And, um, and then I, I shifted as a person and they didn't shift in the same direction and couldn't continue. And that's, that's okay. You know, Mm -hmm. like you're, you should never have to try to prevent yourself from changing or try to change yourself in a extreme way to benefit a relationship. Because ultimately what you want at the end of the day is, is to be happy and fulfilled and and to to know that you know you did it for you and you didn't do it for somebody else you know like you want to at the end of the day you just want to be happy you know and if someone makes you happy good but if someone doesn't make you happy then not good you know (laughs) but also say you know your high school sweethearts Mm -hmm. you get married you have a couple kids and you you know you have certain differences, but you still make it work. Yeah. That's also fine. Yeah. You can be happy and not, uh, <laughs> you can be ha- uh, happy in a relationship, but not be happy all the time. You know, like right. you can be angry at somebody, but still love them and feel super happy with them. You know, like yeah. throw out the rule book. Yep. I yep. feel like we're like standing on uh, like desks in a schoolroom and we're like ripping out no! all the pages rule out book. of a textbook. Yeah. <laughs> Carpe diem. Yeah. <laughs> oh, captain, my, my captain. captain. <laughs> <laughs> um, what have you learned from your relationship together that you are that you know you'll, you know, bring with you into the future, into future relationships, into future, you know, into your future? Oh, I mean, for me, I feel like Ariana Grande said it best, you know, thank you next. You know, one, t- one taught me love, one taught me patience. I was hoping it was something about was a small wa- barbecue. I was wondering why you, you were like, I thank you next. Well, because I was, I was thinking like there's a couple like real lines in there. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I completely relate to that. Like I. You almost yassed. Yeah. <laughs> I took, I, you know, I, I learned a lot of really great things from my, from my last relationship. Mm-hmm. And I don't regret the time that I spent in that relationship and I don't regret the time that I spent in my relationship with Pam. Uh, I became a better person because of it, I feel. And I'm going to take what I learned and then apply that to if to the next person. Maybe I'll never find somebody. That's also fine. But You have this podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This microphone is my, is my wife. Married to work. But yeah. it sounds like you're taking the positives, and I think that's a really great message. I'm just like, I mean, he's always been an optimist. Yeah, there you go. There you yeah, go. it's it's it's. I think it's a hard thing for people to do if you're not thinking about it. It's a perspective change of like, what are the positive things that I can take from this relationship, as opposed to taking the baggage portion of it. Um, I I feel like uh, I I I now have a better understanding of understanding i have a better respect for it because you know um you know i i had a level of patience that you know just kept on going and so i had the time to really figure out ian like i we've joked before that i know ian better than he knows himself it's probably true (laughs) she also knows my parents better than i know them (laughs) Um, but you know, he gave me an understanding and respect of understanding the mindset and the history and the, the, um, the, the complete makeup of a person, you know, like I, I said it 
at the beginning of the relationship where, you know, like I I don't hate people that my significant other has dated. I don't hate the things that they've done because those things brought them to me. Like the, the person that Ian was when we were dating was a culmination of all those experiences, good and bad. And um, when I said it, I, I felt it, but I didn't truly like I didn't have a, a firm knowledge of it. And now I feel I do like I I am a lot more patient with uh, uh, certain certain people in my life <laughs> um, and a lot more understanding to try to understand their perspective instead of being stuck in my own head. You know, like they have their story and I should listen to it a lot more. All right. <laughs> Wise words. What do you guys miss about each other? I know you guys still see each other and you guys talk still, but are there certain things that you guys miss? Um, one of the things that I miss but I love about Ian is he gives me my independence. You know, like he doesn't always want to be in my arm and he doesn't always need to be involved with what I'm doing. And not that that's a bad thing, but I just got so used to the the incredible independence that he gave me that, you know, when confronted with you know, any sort of attachment, I'm like, oh, uh. <laughs> uh, what are you doing? <laughs> um, no, he's always had, uh, we've always had a level of respect for each other. And, you know, I, I feel that, you know, sometimes I, that respect is once in a lifetime. Respect before a relationship, in a relationship, and after a relationship. That is very unique. And, you know, he's given me respect and independence in all aspects of our relationship. And, and, you know, like I, I miss the the romantic um, side of, you know, like being able to love someone but have my own space. You know, like, I, 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 is that do do you understand? Absolutely. Uh, okay. Okay. No, I think it's so counterintuitive what to what women think we want, mm -hmm. right? Like we think like. We, we want somebody to clamor over us and ask where we are every second. And it's like, oh, no, that's like Edward Cullen, like, stalker that sounds like hell. ish, yeah. you know? And it's like, once we have a taste of, like, having our independence and having our partner be like, no, I trust yeah. you. Like, go out there and do it. Like, yep. I'll text you in six hours. Like, yeah. I hope you have a dope day. It, <laughs> I, it, it, it continues us on our journey, on mm -hmm. our own, parallel yep. to, to our partner as opposed to having to have to merge into one lane. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. I, I also think that Ian, out of everybody that I've ever dated or ever even known, has an incredible, like, sturdy trust. Like, he never distrusted me. He never got jealous. He never, like, he was, you know, like, and I think it was one of the things that he said early on where it was just like, hey, if you're going to leave me, you're going to leave me. You know, if you want someone else, you're going to go get them. But, but he trusted me, you know, and, and I, oh man, I've never had that level of trust before. And I probably won't have it ever again, you know? <laughs> Sorry, I ruined you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, the, I mean, to me, trust was the most important thing because there was there was a there was less trust in my last relationship, and that mm -hmm. was and that was a big problem. Like, if you don't have one hundred percent trust on the person you're with, I don't see it working out. Yeah, I just don't. There, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I, I guess I guess the thing that I'm what do I miss most about Pam? Well, uh, I mean, I I hope I am fortunate enough to to find another person that is as loving and understanding and patient as you are. Yeah. And also too, I probably like, you know, I was, I was like his personal assistant. So yeah, I was really bad. I was really bad at um, getting the mail. I yeah. let it pile up and it's piling up right now. Actually, now that I think about it, um, <laughs> well, I got to come over and pick up my mail. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. You still get some things in my house. Mm -hmm. Well, before we wrap up, I have one more question. Okay. And this is pointed to Ian. Ian, what was a harder breakup? You and Pam or you and Anthony? <laughs> oh, Oh, come on. Don't do me like that. Press the buttons. Press the buttons. I don't think I, I don't think I cried. I don't think I, well, I didn't cry with, with Anthony leaving um, because Anthony and I, you know, we, we knew, we knew it was, we knew what had to happen. It was right? coming. Right. Yeah, it was, it was on the wall. It was coming. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And. And with with Pam and I, like, sure, yeah, there was like there was like some something feelings like maybe this maybe this 
won't last maybe. But I was always very optimistic about our relationship. So when she brought up, like, I think we should go on a break, I was like, ah. Uh, each one's different. Each mm-hmm. one's yeah, different. Yeah. 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 So. Was that your answer? That each one is different? <laughs> my, uh, yeah, I, I didn't cry. I didn't cry with, with Anthony. I don't think I did. Anthony got a little teary in our video when we when we left, yeah. Well, I think I think um, the uh, from my perspective, each each breakaway, you you learned some very valuable lessons and you became a better person for it instead of letting it. Like I had the pleasure and honor to watch Ian go through some of the toughest things in his life. Not to say that it was an honor to watch him suffer, but <laughs> I, I watched him grow. I watched very him- Very Japanese of you. Yeah. <laughs> I watched him grow. I watched him make some really hard decisions and then, you know, work towards that. You know, like I, I was, I, I'd come into the office and I'd just be super proud to see him playing boss man. And, you know, like uh, he, he worked really hard and then like seeing after we break up, he's, I do think that he's changed for, for the better and he's really taking the lessons hard. So, you know, each one's different, but I mean, I think you've handled them both with just an amazing amount of strength and grace and you're, you're really good at it. Thank you. (laughs) I mean, I haven't torched this place yet, so there's that. Mm -hmm. Still rising from the ashes. You can't torch it while it's rising. (laughs) (laughs) It's not science. Um, yeah. Well, Pam, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. I feel like this went really well. Mari, yeah. you're you're wonderful. Yeah. Mari. I love you guys. I know we're going to need a big long hug after this. Yeah. And thank you guys for for riding through this journey with us. Wow. Oh man. Gosh dang. Mhm. Um, How was your first therapy session? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. This honestly did feel This honestly did feel like a therapy session, not that I would know do what that's like. Do you feel better? Like. I feel better. Good. How do you how do you guys feel? I feel really good. Yeah, I just feel like it's it's uh I don't know. I mean, I think I, I hope the audience gets a lot out of it where mm-hmm. it's just like the, there's a lot more than what you see out there. Yep. yep. And and that's it's just good. the and truth. That's okay. Mm-hmm. That's, that's all, all right. we do. That's all we do here. We just drop the truth cuz the truth feels the best. Yep. Heck yeah. Yep. Well, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, if you're not yet subscribed on the Smoshcast YouTube, I highly suggest you do that so you could see, you could actually see the tears. Um, and uh, if you, I also just uh, subscribe on the podcast apps to hear the audio b- uh, two days before the video. Mm-hmm. Um, guys, these uh, awesome Smosh shirts uh, and Smosh water bottles and sweatshirt? awesome tidy sweat, tie dye sweatshirts. Tidy, very are tidy. For sale <laughs> on uh, Smosh.store. Thank you guys so much. Uh, if you're on YouTube, hit that bell button. <laughs> Punch uh, it. Um, thank you again, guys. This was insane. Yeah. Yeah. I had a good time. We're I need a family. A, I need a f- nap now. <laughs> 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 Bye. Bye.